What would you do if a foreign country began sending millions of dollars to your country in the form of humanitarian aid, only to discover that their benevolent course of action consisted of murdering unborn children in the womb and secretly sterilizing women of your country so that future generations would never come forth. Tonight, we'll talk with the founder of Culture of Life Africa about what she's doing to end this evil. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and welcome to EWTN Live. A chance to bring you guests from all over the world, and our guest tonight does get all over the world. Uh, she comes from the African country of Nigeria, where she has founded a much needed organization with a global outreach through Culture of Life Africa. She is working hard to protect the institution of marriage to keep families together and make sure mothers and babies get the best medical care possible. So please welcome the founder and president of Culture of Life Africa, Miss Obianuju Ekocha. Thank you. Miss Ekocha, how are you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we're not accustomed to a lot of African names, but you know, the, your name has a meaning. What, what, what is the meaning of your first name? Obianuju means she came in the midst of plenty. So, is that, so. this is a, 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 a name indicating great blessing on you. Did your parents choose that name? Absolutely. Actually, mm -hmm. the name which is given to babies that come after uh, many children. So it's kind of a like a Benjamin kind of name. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, so I, I have had uh, I had already had six siblings before my mom uh, mm -hmm. got pregnant with me, and and it's kind of a name given fondly to a child that comes unexpected. So and again, it's it's not. Uh, a name that means, oh no, we got another baby coming. Absolutely not. It no. means, oh yes, God has blessed us once again. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. You know, that's so nice to hear from parents yeah. that, you know, uh, were, did you, were there any more children after you? No. So you're the youngest mm -hmm. at number seven. I, I remember St. Catherine of Siena mm -hmm. was the 22nd child <laughs> out of 24. <laughs> one yes. man and one woman. Yes. And, I, and, and uh, can you imagine if uh, they had said, come on, honey, let's stop at 20. Oh, we missed that on a great site. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that is one thing with the African people. Children are always a, a blessing, you know. Yeah. Right now, I, I have five uh, surviving siblings, and so we're six children because my mom lost a baby uh, back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice big family, and uh, it's, it's always a beautiful thing for the African people. So your mother doesn't want to give any of them back? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. See, that, that's, uh, that, that's one of the things that people I know who have a lot of children, mm. others might criticize. Oh, how can I have all those kids? Well, you help me choose which one I'm going to give back. Exactly. And, uh, none of them. You love them all. Yes, love them all. absolutely. Now, he, here's um, something that uh, we want to get on to, though, because this is related to the topic, mm. which is Africa has the, this absolutely enormous continent, the second largest continent sure. of the seven. Sure. And uh, you know, with this, there is a love uh, that, that's just part of, well, are there any African cultures that don't want babies that you know of? Not that I know of. I've Not never heard that I know of either. Of. No. The African people love babies. Uh, yeah. For us, children are a gift. They always are a gift and they're a cause for celebration, not just for the family, but for community you know, for, for the community. So it's always a wonderful thing to see in my own 
rural, um, sort of my own rural background, where we come from originally, uh, when a baby is born, there is a lot of dancing and rejoicing by the women. People who are not even members of your family come around and they dance and they sing and they praise God. And most times when you listen to these women in the village, when you listen to them singing, the sort of things they're saying is God has blessed us again. God has given us a child. God has blessed us again. So it's, it's always a great cause for blessing. And that's why it's always quite painful to see when uh, big organizations begin to refer to African babies as an increase in population, you know, for if for if for them we're only just extra numbers, um, that is a different perception of the human person, mm -hmm. which we are hoping will not take within the African society. Well, to to look at children mm -hmm. as just a growing number yeah. is a depersonalization and a dehumanization. That doesn't go over well in Africa, does it? No, uh, but they're trying as hard as they can, it seems, to re-educate my people and to sort of reconfigure the minds of the young ones because they also get into our school systems uh, through their humanitarian aid. Well, wait a minute, I've got a question. Yes. You say they're getting into the school systems. They're trying to, who's they? That is a organizations that are coming through unfortunately uh, in many ways uh, through the United Nations of course the United Nations is a group of member states uh, that come together and they, they are a force for good that's for sure they're doing a lot of great things but also uh, people who are powerful philanthropists for example uh, the Gates Foundation uh, and, many, and this is and Bill and, and Melinda Gates that's right and many yeah. others right. They are coming uh, through various means and through various projects and getting access to the, to the African states, to the African nations, uh, to our school system, to our healthcare system, and in that way, really getting into every facet of our society and injecting into the heart of the, pe uh, of the African culture uh, some of the Western ideology, which we haven't had before. No, he, here's the, the, the question I have. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation yeah. is itself a charitable organization. Yes. What is their interest in African population exactly that uh, you can tell? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm not in, in the mind and heart of, of the gates and I don't know what it is that is the driving force or their, their own intentions for doing what they do. Uh, but I'll say that they have done some really good work, okay, and it, it, their good intentions, you know, you can see from the outset what they claim are the good intentions and what the good things they do, I applaud them for it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that um, the, in more recent years, at least, I have noticed that uh, especially uh, some of the projects that Melinda Gates, uh, his wife, Melinda mm -hmm. Gates, has led in Africa is population control themed and population control minded. So she is trying to start off a new culture uh, of contraception among the African people. Mm -hmm. She's pushing it as what they call the unmet need. That if it's unmet need, that means that people are demanding it. But really, it's not evident that the African people are demanding or asking for contraception. We have needs for other things. Uh, but she is pushing it as really the first point or the be all and end all of development for the African women. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about things like education? What about uh, good health care, you know, general well-being of the African women, I mean, the, the, nutrition the, and water. You know, one of the things that uh, certainly is a major problem mm. throughout Africa and some other countries is the uh, uh, prominence of malaria. Sure. And mal malaria control is certainly a much bigger issue That's right. that Africans feel. That's right. Absolutely, Father. And and if 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 they were to invest in, in projects like that, fighting of malaria, 
fighting of, you know, of drought and famine and things that will really affect the African populations and things that people are asking for within their communities, that would be a better, better way of spending the money or a better way of helping the African communities get to development. Well, it's, it sounds almost, again, I, I, I don't know, Melinda, mm. uh, but it seems as if, look, you don't have enough water so stop having so many children and you won't need as much water. Exactly. It, would that seem to be the logic to you? Yes, that, that, in fact, somebody, I forget who said it, but someone said that they trying to fight poverty by getting rid of the poor. Okay, yeah. so if okay. you reduce the amount of poor people born into society, then we are get eradicating poverty. But that is not the best approach to it. And that, mm. is, that is not, I mean, in, in doing that, you are actually uh, at the risk of, of removing human dignity and, you know, and trampling on human dignity. And also uh, that will affect the way the Africans see the human life and the sanctity of life. And, and also, you know, that, that filters into everything else that we do. Mm -hmm. So that is a terrible approach. It, it, it seems then that um, the, the, what's, what's going on is an attempt to impose the culture of upper crust Westerners on the general population of Africa, a, a sort of cultural imperialism. Sure. Absolutely, that is what it is. I have heard it described as, as cultural imperialism and social imperialism, and, and that is exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And this is what, uh, you know, kind of an ideology which has, which has been somehow developed and is now being propagated and spread by certain groups, not even everybody, but by certain groups within the Western uh, nations, right. Right. you know, right. uh, America, United Kingdom, France, Germany, some of these countries, the Netherlands, uh, places, especially places where, where the faith has been relegated to the back burner of society. Mm -hmm. uh, these, are, these are ideologies that are now being, you know, sort of being used to replace religion and faith, and they're trying to push that into Africa. But see, in, in these, some of these countries, excluding the United States, mm -hmm. where it's not quite the case, yes. but in a lot in, in European in countries, countries yeah. and in the state of Israel, for instance, mm -hmm. you have this attitude very prevalent, but it becomes suicidal yes. because yes. their populations are decreasing. Yeah. Russia, for instance, population is going down by one million people a year. Yeah. True. Japan at least a hundred thousand, and you know Israel's birth rate is less than one child yeah. per family among Israelis, yeah. uh, and, so, and the rest of Europe about one point two to one point five, depending on the country. Yeah. So it's so their suicidal says, a culture is what they want to give to Africa. That's exactly right. Uh, they're trying to reduce fertility rate. I don't know if you, um, yeah, I was at the United Nations. I had the privilege of being at the United Nations last week. So you, so, so you, you were speaking at the United Nations? No, I didn't speak, but okay. I went to support uh, okay. other right. African nations mm -hmm. and uh, to support some of the delegates that were there. And I went to do pro-life advocacy at, at the UN because last week was particularly important. Last week was when uh, they had the conference on population and development. So this is 20 years post Cairo. You know, there was a yeah. big conference in yeah, Cairo. Yeah, the, explain what the Cairo is so that we can understand what you were doing. Sure. What was the Cairo meeting? Now, the Cairo conference happened in 1994. That was exactly 20 mm -hmm. years ago. And that was the big conference on population and development where it was unveiled this massive plan to begin the gradual depopulation of the world among other things. So back then when... Did, when by the way, did they say how low they want the population to go? They didn't actually specify in numbers, mm -hmm. but not that, I, not, that, not that I know of. But the strategy was very clear, and they had this thing they called the program of action. So different nations were encouraged to put in place um, projects and programs that will encourage women to take up contraception. And of course, the people, for the people who started pushing uh, legal abortion, they got even more 
courageous at that time. Um, I know then Hillary Clinton was much younger and she was at this conference in Cairo mm -hmm. and she was quite instrumental in starting off this movement. She was in favor of getting other cultures yes. to follow Western culture. True. So yes. she was being culturally imperialist. At the time, yes. And I believe Vice President Al Gore yes. was part of that too. I think so. Yeah, because I remember he came back very yeah. angry. Yeah. Uh, so. Because the Muslim nations and the, and the Catholic team. nations yeah. and the Catholic Church and yes. others yes. Put, pushed, yes. pushed at back. This, at the time, um, Blessed John Paul II uh, gave a, a strong support to, of course, to the Holy See, but also he did a big call out to all uh, pro-life organizations and pro-life NGOs to come forward mm -hmm. and defend life. And it, it gave the impetus to people who were working in the pro-life um, arena to come up and, and fight this as a global struggle. So that has started 20 years ago, and this is the post-20 that we, we had. You know, this was Cairo plus 20. All right, so 20 years after uh, the Cairo, Cairo meeting, and that's yes. why I wanted to go over just a, a lot of folks will yes. forget yes, that that course. happened. Yes. It's a political thing. So, yes. um, so 20 years later, they, they didn't get it done. No. They tried it again at Beijing, yes, correct? That's right. A few five, years afterwards. Five years after, yeah. Right. And then, now, now what do they do? What do they, what's their plan right now, 20 years after Cairo The meeting? push continues. Uh, they have had, uh, all through last week, all kinds of events, all kinds of side events. Different countries, of course, had to give account, in a sense of speaking, of where they're at 20 years after Cairo. Account of what? What do they have to account for? <laughs> so things like, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, is your, what is your population to start with, and what is the kind of acceptance of contraception within your society, what is the contraception user's prevalence, um, what is your country doing for development. Uh, some countries were very clear that they were not going to be a part of that agenda. Mm -hmm. I know my country fought back, Nigeria, they were very clear that the sexual and reproductive rights agenda, which they're pushing really hard, uh, that we were not going to accept it. So that was the kind of speech that they gave, the Nigerians. But some other countries um, were good as well, like Egypt. Egypt mm -hmm. spoke really well. Some of the Arab countries were very clear. Uh, Zimbabwe spoke very well. Um, but the Western nations, like Australia, it's terrible. Uh, a country like Ethiopia, where, where of course abortion has been legal since 2005, they gave a terrible speech. So, so well, what did they? What was so terrible about their speech? Because uh, the the person, I think it was either an ambassador or a minister from from Ethiopia, who was presenting his country uh, to to the United Nations, he he made allusions that since they legalized abortion, uh, he's, he implied that that maternal health has improved. And of course, uh, that is very doubtful. I don't live in Ethiopia, but that is very doubtful. Mm -hmm. um, Ethiopia is, is a very poor country. Yes. And they do need a lot of help. And their women do need a lot of help. Things like education, you know, have to be have to be looked into in, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, even nutrition, because I know they've had a lot of difficulty with, with food and water supplies. But they are still pushing because ever since they, they legalized or liberalized abortion, I'd say in 2005, they have been the darling of, of Planned Parenthood, you know, the, uh, their international arm, which is IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation. So they oh, have. Planned Parenthood shows its head again, yes, does it? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So they have been the darling of, of Planned Parenthood and Marie Stopes International and such organizations that are, you know, abortion giants, basically. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, well, so it all comes back. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the reason, you know, I, I, I say that is, um, you know, the foundress yeah. of. Planned Parenthood, yes. by the 1930s, developed mm -hmm. a program that was very anti-African American. Sure. And now they've become anti-African. Yes, absolutely. You know, so uh, you know, she, she had uh, one of the things. I did a little sidelight, but she had spoken to a women's group of no. the Ku Klux Klan. And they were so excited by her plans, they invited her to five more meetings. Oh. 
because and and she later and, and uh, this is in her autobiography, by the way. Mm. Um, but also later on, she said we don't want it to get out that we have plans to exterminate the black race. That is exterminate is her word. word. And so. Now, and, and in this country, mm. you know, 78% yeah. of Planned Parenthood's clinics are in African-American neighborhoods, yes. even though African-Americans are 12% of our population. That's right. So now they commend an African nation for accepting their death dealing and yes. Um, yes. apparently race-related yes. issues. Yes, absolutely. Ethiopia has fallen, you know, Ethiopia has fallen. Uh, so has South Africa anyway. You know, South Africa is uh, even earlier than that, 1997, mm -hmm. they, they legalized and liberalized abortion. And if you look at these African countries that have accepted abortion, life is not any better for women. It only perpetuates violence. In South Africa, the rape rate is the highest in Africa. And even in most parts of the world, I mean, it's right high up there. I read a, a study that said uh, somebody was making a kind of a projection saying that if, if South Africa continues on this path with the rape patterns, 50% of South African, all South African women will be raped at least once in their lifetime before they die. 50%? Yes. So this is a, I mean, for one thing, yeah, this is an outrageous once. crime yeah. against any woman who suffers it, it's horrible Absolutely. for them. And I've certainly dealt with, mm -hmm. you know, situations yeah. in the aftermath. Yeah. And it's a horrible, horrible act of yeah. violence. Yeah. And, you know, to have 50% yeah. is well, outrageous. Once in their lifetime. Um, now, it, but did, did that get brought up? at the United Nations meetings? No, absolutely. I mean, I was there for a whole week and I never heard anybody talk about sexual violence. All they were fighting about was sexual rights and how to push this um, sort of uh, this agenda where abortion is extended to every country in the world. And the most, um, the most disconcerting thing was that they kept talking about access to abortion for women and girls. So they want abortion, not just for women, but for girls. Mm -hmm. And of course, what they are beginning to define as discrimination is when a country refuses to give access uh, uh, to abortion to women and girls. Mm -hmm. So they're redefining terms as well. And well, see, with, you know, I, I hope you communicate to, you know, your, your countrymen in Nigeria mm -hmm. and in other African nations, sure. that is the same thing they did here. <laughs> it they has they, happened, they yeah. changed from pro-abortion to pro-choice, yes. which is just a change of words yeah. to make the horror sound better. And if you show yeah. pictures yeah. of what an abortion actually does to a child, then they call you yeah. the bad person. Yeah. It is, I mean, it's, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And they keep playing on words and they keep playing on people's psyche. So uh, they have done It's called this. propaganda. Yes, they're pushing it. Yes. They're pushing it and they, they, they want it to be um, sort of acceptable to society and palatable to society. One of the funny questions during one of these uh, side lectures I went to at the UN was somebody who was asking about her country. She says, how do we destigmatize abortion? And I'm saying, how do you destigmatize uh, the killing of a baby? You, you want to bring it into a culture and then you're also looking for a way to make it acceptable to people. So the lady from France was the person who answered that question and she gave a whole list of what France has done in order to make abortion normal you know and part of it being uh, the removal of parental authority so what do you mean by removal of parental authority so by law uh, France has put laws in place so that even if a child of maybe 13 or 14 years gets pregnant the the child's parents do not have the right to not have the right to stop her having abortion they don't have a say mm -hmm. so as long as that child wants the abortion uh, the lady from France said by law, the child will get access to abortion. Yes. So in, in things like this, I hope nations will understand, even African nations, that the moment they open the doors to abortion, uh, also parental authority will be undermined 
because there are people who are standing in place in all these international organizations ready to, to muzzle parents, ready to muzzle religious groups as well, um, and they're very serious about it. Oh, well, I'm sure as, they are. Yeah, as long as they get what they want. Exactly, which is which the is reduction of Africans yes. and Caribbeans yes. and people that they think, they think are need to, to be them. reduced. That's right. Yes. And for so, whatever reason. Yeah. Well, see, now this is why we want to have you on here, <laughs> to let people know this is the gag they're up to. Yes. They're anti-family. Yes. They're you know, anti-family. And, and, and we have to, you know, Africans mm. need to know, do you want to lose your grandchildren mm -mm. and the right of caring for your own children? Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. Uh, it's. It's insidious. The plan, and they keep pushing it as as good as healthcare, and they're pushing it as uh, you know the well-being of women, uh, the you know women emancipation. But unfortunately, in nations that have accepted abortion, once again, I say, women are not any better off in lots of ways. Um, in those countries, you have, uh, you know, reduced uh, rates of marriage. So, of course, you know, if you, if you, uh, abortion and contraception are pushed within a, a culture, uh, the healthy marriage culture, which we have in many parts of Africa, we will lose that. Invariably, we will lose that. Well, so. let me just let you and folks in our, on not only our American audience, but our African audience yeah. be aware mm. what happened here mm -hmm. since 1970 when the contraceptive pill yes. and all the contraceptive devices that are even less effective, yep. plus the legalization of abortion, mm -hmm. all came into play in the early 1970s. Sure. And the result has been an increase from two sexually transmitted diseases to yep. over 40. True. An increase so that 20% of the population is infected with one of those diseases mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. We went from 5% to now 43% of children being born out of wedlock. And an increase uh, in the year after yeah. abortion was legalized. Mm -hmm. The murder rate for children five and under increased by 100% in one year. That's so, and, and again, you can check some of those statistics if you go to Dr. Richard Wetzel's book, Sexual Wisdom. Mm -hmm. He's got the graphs. Mm -hmm. So this has been a catastrophe for our families. Oh. Not to mention 55 million deaths. Of course. So. Babies. This is what you don't want for Africa. Absolutely not. We, I mean, this will, this will bring about a, a terrible devastation for my people, and we don't want that. We no. because already Africa has a lot of challenges. So what we don't need is is an attack of the family, mm -hmm. because the family is really is really a core part of of the African culture. Yes. Well, look, we want you to be able to get some more information about the struggle for life in Africa and all around the world. So please go to the website, www.cultureoflifeafrica.com. And they have a lot of information there and you can find out more of it. We're gonna take a little break, come back in a couple minutes and start getting some other questions. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back. Um, first of all, I want to invite you to come here and be part of our audience. Uh, if you can make a pilgrimage down here to, our, uh, to EWTN, uh, we'd love to have you. Our pilgrimage department has a phone number you can call, which is 205-271-2966. Or if you go to the website, EWTN.com, you can find out more information there as well and be able to, uh, you know, find out places. All right, well, first of all, times for masses, programs, tours of the studios, plus uh, opportunities to get up to Hansful, places where you can stay here or there, and good places to eat, all that stuff. So we'd love to have you come here and join us. So come if you can. You know, be, before we get to a question, um, I just, uh, you know, want to mention one other issue, which is uh, it's not only these non-governmental organizations, the NGOs, that are causing problems, but also some of the governments are tying foreign aid to being, you know, family planning, which means contraception and abortion. Is that the case in Nigeria? Absolutely. Uh, in again, more recent years, we have noticed that uh, the, the wealthy nations, they call them the donor nations sometimes, they are tying their help to targets and to uh, projects that are that are family planning based again as you say these are these are elements of population control mm -hmm. so the united states through usaid through their agency usaid uh, they're doing a lot of that mm -hmm. especially with with your uh, present administration unfortunately we've seen a lot of that uh, and also with the United Kingdom, they have a, a similar organization, which is government run, it's called DFID, Department for International Development. They do exactly the same thing that USAID does, and they push abortion and contraception on, on nations as well. You know, it, it's, it's somewhat surprising to me because, you know, our, our president's father came from Kenya. Mm -hmm. He has a brother still living there, other relatives there. Yep. And, you know, to have a, a policy that is anti-African people mm -hmm. is, is, is horrendous, no matter who the president is. Oh, sure. Uh, but it's also the same thing that's been done in the Philippines, yep. Mexico, and, and very Catholic countries. Yes. They do the same thing. The politicians yeah. fall for it. Yeah. They, it's less the people. Yes. It's the politicians exactly. who say, oh, yeah, I'll take your aid. Yeah, because for them, aid means, you know, more money. More money goes into, into the government parasitals. More, more money goes into the ministries of health and, you know, all of that. And they take it that we're moving more money into our system. Uh, but the problem is that the people that you're representing are inherently pro-life mm -hmm. and they're pro-family and these things that you're accepting as gifts or as aid uh, are actually directly uh, against the people's culture you know these and, are and, and against the lives yes, of the people of the people diametrically opposed to our way of life that's what it is mm. uh, in many in many cases as well it's quite challenging for people of faith because you push in contraception in this massive way to cultures where you know people are faithful to to teachings you know to Christian teachings and to mm -hmm. Christian understanding of human sexuality and you're pushing abortion in places where people are faithful uh, to a particular religion then you, you are not helping the people because faith is a very central part of our, our way of life in Africa. People are subscribed to faith and they're faithful to their religion, you know. And it's also something that's contrary not only to the growing Christian population, mm -hmm. uh, which are now the majority of Africa, yes. but also to the Muslim, yes. which is a significant minority in Africa. Islam yes. is absolutely yeah. against abortion. Yes. And so this is trying to undercut their faith yes. and Christian faith. And Christian faith. faith. So this is also an area that 
you know, where I think Christians and Muslims can come together in a very beautiful way yeah. to fight for the integrity of the family and, and for, for sanctity of life. Lives. Yeah, for sanctity of life yes. and for dignity of, of the women. Exactly. So we can come together and fight in this way. And I think in a way, I've heard it said in many forums and at many times, uh, one of the biggest fears of the international organizations in terms of Africa is the, un the uniting of the Christians and Muslims of Africa uh, mm -hmm. to fight this battle to ensure that Africa is kept pro-life. Or pro another, the other side of that is yes. they believe in divide and conquer. Yes. So if you can keep the Africans divided yes. against each other, yeah. then you can encourage them to that's do right. what Western imperialistic culture wants. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, here's something we're gonna take a, a question from our studio yeah. audience. First of all, uh, sir, where are you from? Uh, from Williamsburg, Virginia. Good to have you here. Welcome. That's supposed to be a very pretty place. It is. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, you have to get over there. And so you're, uh, you don't work at the uh, park, do you? No, I don't. No, okay. No, you're not making candles or something. <laughs> All right. So uh, what's your question? Uh, I would like to find out what, uh, what methods do you use to fight back against this propaganda, the policies, all this aid money that you've talked about that's coming into Africa, uh, and how effective do you think you're being? Right. Thank you, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, my organization is only a very tiny organization that was founded, you know, not even two years ago, but I have had a lot of support and I've had a lot of help. Um, now, I find that what has been quite effective is the Catholic Church, you know, the Catholic Church is quite powerful in Africa and that the Catholic Church is everywhere in <laughs> Africa. <laughs> they, they are doing ex exceptional work, incredible work. So I try to somehow get close to the bishops as, as much as I can be allowed. And I try to serve the church. You know, I try to serve uh, in helping to do a pro uh, maybe organize pro-life conferences. We organized two pro-life conferences last year, which were very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, this time around, there is a massive conference, which is which we're looking forward to and we're preparing for with great excitement. It's the pro-life, massive international pro-life conference coming up in Nigeria this June. And it's being hosted by the Bishops' Conference of Nigeria. So all the bishops of Nigeria are coming together to endorse and host this event. Uh, and in this way, we can, you know, spread the word to the people. The aim of my organization is really just to educate, inform, sensitize people and help to, to bring other pro-life organizations to the fore where they're able to articulate the African values mm -hmm. and try to promote, uh, you know, the, the, this reality that Africa can indeed be kept pro-life and pro-family even in the midst of what is happening around the world. In other words, that the women yes. will be encouraged to continue to dance yes. at the birth of every child. <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah. That is for sure. Yeah. That's for sure, yes. Now, you also, you mentioned that you met with uh, some of the bishops uh, because it is the, the Catholic Church that is running orphanages, oh, yes. schools. Oh, yes. well, most of the hospitals yeah. were founded by Missionaries of a wide variety of Christian churches. Of uh, the Catholics are the largest, but you yes. know many other churches sure, too sure. have Greek clinics, medical doctors come from the West Working. to help food distribution, health care, all yes. this. Yes. But you also met with the Pope. I did. Very, what was that like? It was a great blessing. This was last October, so a couple of you know months ago. Uh, what happened was the Pontifical Council for Laity were organizing a seminar for the 25 years anniversary of uh, Blessed John Paul II's now uh, soon to be Saint, Saint John Paul II's document on women, Mulieris Dignitatem. Yes. And a hundred women were invited from around the world, from different countries, from different uh, you know, continents. And I was one of the African women invited to this event, which is quite a privilege. So we, we were there for a series of lectures and a series of you know, great talks and great uh, discussions that we had at the Vatican for over a period of three days. And right at the end, we were told that the Holy Father was going to meet with us. So we were, we were taken to, to the papal palace, uh, the apostolic palace there at, at, at the Vatican. And uh, I didn't realize he was going to meet us 
one by one you know I thought he, he was just going to talk to us and because that was the same weekend as well that he he did the consecration to the Blessed Mother same weekend it was clashing so I didn't know he was going to have time to meet all hundred women but Pope Francis in his style he decided he was going to meet with every single one of us uh -huh. so he prayed for us he sp first of all he spoke to us he gave us a fantastic talk on 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 the role of women in society and the role of women in the church and he thanked us because most of the women were in different kinds of ministry so uh, he prayed for us and then he met us one by one and blessed us and that was great oh, that's nice. and, I, and I cried like a baby because <laughs> I was overwhelmed but yeah. it was quite incredible because when I was going up to meet him I had nothing to tell him I said in my mind I can't speak Spanish and I don't know what to say and this is you know this is the Holy Father but he surprised me because when I got to him and I was introduced to him by Cardinal Rilko who is the president of the Pontifical Council for the Laity I heard him say to the Holy Father who I was and what I did because I had met Cardinal Rilke prior to that um, and the Holy Father turns to me and speaks in perfect English oh, and says to me please pray for me and he held my hand and said please pray for me and I was overwhelmed you know and I and I, I waved I said yes Holy Father I will pray for you so that was that was incredible yeah I think he's you know, being a typical Jesuit, he's always <laughs> learning something else. And I, think, I suspect he's studying some English. We have another question from our studio sure. audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Hi, I'm from Colombia in South America. Good to have you. Welcome. Thank your you question. very much. So my question is, I am sure that this is something that might be happening in other countries and in other parts of the world, um, and it's still undercovered. And I want to know how people from other countries can either help like your cause or they can help what is going on in their countries and, and, and start working towards it, because I'm sure there's a lot of silence in other places, and I just want to know what can they do in order to help. Oh, well, great question. You're right. Your supposition is absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot going on elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, this is, what would you respond to? In the first place, it's actually right. There is this is happening everywhere because this is this is a global attempt. It is a, a globalization of the new morality of the West mm -hmm. and they're moving and progressing into every nation. So these, in other words, these are missionaries of evil. Yes, in exactly. In the culture of death. Yes, these are missionaries of the culture of death and they're disseminating and propagating their ideology to every corner of the earth. Mm -hmm. So what one can do um, is to begin to one get informed I think that's the first thing to get informed with the issues if you're if you're interested in a particular country find out who are the friends of the country you know who are the who are the humanitarian um, donors donors yes. who are the people who are coming to the aid of your country what kind of money is coming into your country and through whom who are the philanthropists find, find out yes which uh, how much money your country gets from America? Exactly. And find out what are the strings they attach to the aid they give us. Precisely. Here. U.S. said uh, the, a lot of their budget is public domain. So what I do, I regularly mm -hmm. go through, whenever their budget comes out, I go through and try to find out how much is going to things like nutrition, how much is going to medicine, how much is going to malaria projects, how much is going to tuberculosis, and how much is going to family planning. And you will find out that family planning, in a lot of ways, is outweighing almost everything else. So, surprise, so, surprise. <laughs> so read, uh, try to find out and get informed about who comes into your country and what they're bringing into your country. And you can also write articles. These days, thank God for the internet. Um, people are blogging about things like this. People are putting up uh, things on Facebook as well. If you're from a particular country and you have a lot of Facebook friends from your country, do tell them what you find out. If you find out in your studies and in your, in your little inquiries, if you find out something of concern, go back to the fa to, to social media and put it out so that people can begin to speak about it. Try to alert the church, the Catholic church in your country, if you're able to do that, you try to tell the bishops because they're always um, sort of a good um, authority to go to with, with these things because the government in many cases are in collaboration with the Western governments, you know. So the Catholic Church it will be a good place to go to. If you know, if you're not Catholic, you can also try to alert your own pastors, you know, your yes. own. There is, I mean, a lot of Christian pastors in Africa 
that a, a, non, a lot of non-Catholic Christian pastors in Africa are doing really good work as well. Yes. But they do have to be informed because many of them are not informed on some of these things. Uh, so you inform them, you begin to write about it, you can put out articles about it and raise begin to raise awareness because what you find in most of these countries is that most people are pro-family and the moment you're able to show them that their their culture is being undermined and you know their way of life is being threatened with this new ideology or this new kind of humanitarian aid people rise up and they begin to speak well in, it strikes me uh, from what i've heard from um various uh, non-Catholic African clergy that while their counterparts in the West are the same denomination, yes, uh, Anglicans and say Episcopalians sure. here, uh, even though they, 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 they belong to the, the same, same church, church in many ways, they do not no. accept the pro-abortion, pro-contraception, anti-family or, or openness to re redefining family that you get here, they are coming out of the experience of Africa and Christianity yes. fitting together well. Absolutely, and that is the truth, Father. I know a lot of wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. Pentecostals, yes. uh, Anglicans, Methodists who are doing exceptional work. They are pro-life, they're very pro-life, they're very pro-family, um, they're very pro-marriage. And so what is happening in, in some of the counterpart churches in the West, it's, it's, a, it's a cause of concern and pain for them. You yes, know. exactly. It is a cause of pain for them. And so, so much so that there are many folks yeah. in this country who belong to those same denominations yeah. that have now joined African diocese, yes. Dava Parish here, True. but they are uh, you know, Anglicans whose bishop is in Africa because True. the morals yes. is Christian rather than accommodation to, to secular. New, yes, to the new morality. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. These are, these are incredible times and, and we get to see things changing. Every day mm -hmm. we wake up, it's like there's a new law, there's a new bill, there's a new, you know, each country is trying to redefine culture and civilization as we know it. So that's why we're praying very hard that this doesn't come to Africa because it will be a big devastation to the people and to the future as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, it, it's, it's been devastating uh, in, in this country in many ways. Yeah. Um, our own African-American community yeah. uh, has been devastated by a lot of the introductions, but so, so is every community in this country. Yes. You know, it, it seems to be worse now because they've been, I, I think they've been targeted in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Um, and so this is a, a, a super problem. Now it's something, um, also I wanna mention, uh, to relate to that lady's last question, yes. Human Life International yep. has all kinds of organizations around the world Wonderful. doing that. That's a good place to get started as oh, well. Yes. Uh, just uh, Human Life International is on the internet. Yes, Human uh, Life International, I have done, uh, I have worked closely with them because last year when I had two conferences in Africa, I had one of their directors in education and research come out to speak. His name is uh, Dr. Brian Close. Oh yes, he, I, I know Brian, Dr. Oh, Brian, Brian yes. was awesome. Yes, he, he is. He gave incredible lectures uh, during our conferences. And so I know, you know a lot about Human Life International and the kind of exceptional work they're doing in Africa and different parts of Africa. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, hli.org yes. is their website HLI. if you're interested. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I've done some work with them too yeah. over the years, yeah. uh, you know, of uh, helping you know, them to get information to yes. religious leaders yes. uh, of all denominations, the seminarians, yeah. bishops, priests, so that they can then disseminate it more widely. Yeah. Yeah, even the conference that is that is upcoming as well, uh, Brian will be there as well. But in addition to that, there will be some other organizations as well. There will be uh, Universal Chastity Education, which mm -hmm. is which is this wonderful ministry uh, that 
spreads and propagates the message of chastity and even though the founders are Americans they do a lot of their work uh, Andrew Denovix and his parents there's three of them working together spread in the message of chastity they're doing a lot of their work in Uganda in well, the from Colorado I, I remember that there was in particular a sister religious sister yes. in Uganda mm -hmm. who was also spearheading this yes now Let's, let's take a look at that in terms of the issue History. we brought up yes. as uh, regards to cultural imperialism. Mm -hmm. Is this the West trying to impose chastity on Africa? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> no. I, m my sense <laughs> is that African family life yes. had it's a treated. sense of honorable yes. preparation for marriage. Oh, yes. yes. That marriage is not something that you sort of, like buying a used car, you kick the tires and no. see if you like this one, if not, try another one. But it's, there's an honorable preparation yeah. we have a healthy that your point. family and you are honored by or dishonored. Mm -hmm. Would that be a common part of African culture? Absolutely. We have a very healthy marriage culture, especially with the confusion happening in different parts of the world. Now, we have a healthy marriage culture and um, chastity, we are very already disposed to receiving and accepting the message of chastity. It is true in the last couple of, couple of years, we've had problems with cable television and of course introducing with, pornography yes yes and all kinds of um sort of internet, a, a, the, internet the loose uh sort of a post-christian if you like post-christian attitude towards human sexuality mm -hmm. and how people are cohabiting people are seeing this in you know in sitcoms in american sitcoms and you know people are uh, filtering through these messages and it's affecting especially the more educated class of Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, we are suited and we are more conditioned to accepting very well the message of chastity, especially because we have family respect as well, and we have respect for parents, and we have respect for authority, especially religious authorities. Mm -hmm. So, And elderly people and elderly are respected. People. I, my, my sense is that yes. the elder members of a family and a clan mm. are not pushed off but are sought out absolutely is that that is for sure i mean an example is my dad he wouldn't like me saying this but my dad turns 80 this year but my dad is the head of a, a family of of uh, seven brothers you know he there's seven seven brothers uh, in, in his family six or seven brothers and I have a big family around that because they all have children and so we have a family of uh, maybe about 70 people or 80 people. I have lots of cousins and my dad is seen as the family, the head of the family mm -hmm. and everybody respects him. So that means even my younger cousins when they want to get married they actually come to him to pay respect to him. Mm -hmm. That's very touching to see as, mm -hmm. as well especially now you know I've lived in the West and I know that it's kind of you know none of your business kind of thing but, but no. Oh, my cousins still come to him uh, to to pay respect and I in a lot of ways I respect my uncles who are younger than my dad and I always try to pay respect to them in different ways and there are lots of things that I will not do because I uh, I remember that I have uncles and aunties who will ask me to give account <laughs> 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 so they don't just want you to give them respect, no. they call you to task. They call me to task. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a lot of respect for our elders and you know, even, even among siblings as well, there is a very um, high respect for siblings and, and aunties and uncles and of course parents. Uh, but with the new culture of death attitude, uh, there is a, uh, this privacy that, that is happening and a lot of individualism and, and people are being broken up, you know, into their own little worlds and that's terrible. You well, know. see, that's, that's, that's one of the issues life. about going to the elders about a marriage is that the marriage affects everybody in the family. It does, yes. It's not, you know, like, like I always tell couples, Unless you are marrying a complete orphan, yeah. you get all the in-laws. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> you know this is. Yeah. You know, the, the married people in the audience are laughing already <laughs> because they know that that's the case, uh, and that can be that should be a help. Yes. You know, not yes. a hindrance. Yeah. So, so this is uh, an important, and vibrancy of African culture, yes. that 
the world needs to cherish and stop attacking. Yes. By that would be our basic message. Yes. Stop attacking Africa. Yes. And cherish the gift it has to offer the rest the of the world. world. That's right. That's yeah. right. Because irrespective of our limitations and our difficulties, we do have a lot. We do have a lot that we are proud of and a lot that we're grateful for. Exactly. So that's what we want to hold on to. Well, By thank you very much for coming here to thank share you. that with us. Thank you. And for the efforts you are doing to help keep African culture very much alive. Thank you. Not as a museum piece, but as alive. Thank you. And I'd like to give, again, the website is cultureoflifeafrica.com. You can go there and make that one word, cultureoflifeafrica.com. Well, it's time for us to end. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause this face to shine upon you in all of the ways that you go. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, you know, we can bring you guests from Africa and all sorts of other places and do all the programs we do because you make this network possible. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills. Thank you.